perspective, one of the most interesting and important sessions on this conference. Um, we have a strong field today. It's going to present us some perspectives. And uh, especially after the session this morning, I think it's more important than ever that we step, take a step back and think a little bit about what is this sport, what is the game that we're playing, and what is the future. Our presenters today in have in common that they're all going to push the button and reload our minds with some way of thinking about sport. And the first presenter today is Uwe Korsgaard, who is a very experienced guy in the field of playing this game. Um, he's going to introduce us to some of the backgrounds of even the whole Play the Game conference, I assume. So welcome, Uwe Korsgaard. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, in this um, program, uh, Jens Seyer has written an article called Why Democracy Matters in Movement and Sports Culture. And there he referred to um, <coughs> Gerlev Idræts Højskole or Gerlev Sports Academy. Um, and I have promised to say mm. a few words about uh, this uh, academy and with mm. which uh, Jens Seyer became part of in the 1980s. I um, um, yeah, I myself, oh, this is not okay. It doesn't quite figure yeah, together with this here, but it do doesn't matter. Um, yeah, I myself was uh, principal at uh, Gerlev uh, Idrætshøj School, also what we also call the folk high school or people's high school, emphasizing on sport and, and gymnastic. I was principal from 1974 to 1991. And in that period, uh, this uh, uh, high school expanded with different um, institutions, so to say. Uh, we established what we call Idrætsforsk, uh, a research center dealing with the humanities and social science, uh, science of body culture. And a number of people were connected to this uh, research center. Uh, Klaus Bøger, Søren Rieskær, Eichel Jespersen, and Henning Eikberg, we will uh, you will meet after me. And we also established uh, what, what, what was called and what still is called uh, Gerlo Playground. Uh, you could say it is a living um, sports historical workshop with <coughs> names uh, as uh, Jan, uh, Jan Müller and Lars Hazelton were working with this. And instead of uh, <coughs> establishing a sports museum, it was on the, on the agenda at that time, we should have a sports museum in Denmark. Then we decided at this uh, high school to establish a living m museum, so to say, where you could try uh, different types of play, games, dance, and, and combats, and so on. So instead of looking at uh, an old shoe, shoe connected to a famous uh, basketball player, then you could take part in activities. And this is still uh, an important uh, part of this uh, folk high school. Then we also in, in 1978 established the Galileo Award to some, uh, we gave to some people who, uh, yeah, who have difficulties to uh, be part of the normal uh, sports uh, uh, award. So uh, we um, gave this uh, award in the 90s to Donato, uh, to uh, Jenkins, and also to uh, play the game. And 
as uh, I said, Jens Seyer Andersen, he always referred to this milieu at this place in the 1980s because he see play the game as a baby uh, born out of this uh, activities and, and me meeting and working together with these people at uh, this place in the 1980s. Yeah, here you can see um, <coughs> the, oh, there is something which are not working correct, okay. But here you can see uh, the, the, the institution, Galio Idrætshøj School. It was a, a high school for about 130 uh, young students from 18 to 25 or something like that. But it was also here that uh, we, uh, yeah, we established this playground. You can see on the left side uh, one of the several hundred of different games and play from old time. Uh, and to the right you can see a new building we built. So we call it an art movement house. We had a gymnastic, classic gymnastic hall, and we had a sports hall. Uh, but then we we would like to have a third type of uh, of, uh, of uh, hall, uh, and we m built uh, this uh, this hall. Um, at uh, this uh, research center, um, <coughs> we differentiate uh, between sport and body culture, and it became very important in our historical work. And, and also when we look at present uh, days, because there is, uh, today there is a tendency to use the concept sport very broad. But uh, we narrowed the concept sport and looked at sport as a specific type of body culture, a specific type which came into being at a certain point in history. So we, don't, we haven't had sport from old time. We have had a lot of different body cultures, different styles. We have had uh, a lot of different combats, and we have had uh, dance, and we have had, uh, uh, in Asia, they have had martial arts and yoga, and in Africa, they have dance. And so there is a lot of different types of body culture. But sport is only one type. Uh, so, uh, um, <coughs> and it became very important uh, in our study uh, of, uh, of history and uh, the present situation. We were <coughs> particularly interested in the connection between sportification and industrialization, or modernization, you could say, because there is a clear connection between sport uh, and, uh, and industrialization, or modernization. Um, <coughs> before we had other kind of um, body culture, the aristocracy had the uh, type, with quite other norms and ideals and values connected to, uh, to, to uh, body culture. Then came up with sport. So sport, to some extent, broke down the old structure of uh, body culture, the old value system, the old norm system. At Gali, we were particularly also interested in, in uh, gymnastic as a specific type of body culture. Gali Idrætshøj School itself is part of uh, the people's high school movement in Denmark. The, uh, and, and gymnastic became a very important part of this high school movement and this, uh, it was also connected to the countryside, to the peasants movement and, and this um, gymnastic became very important in the transition from uh, what we could call an estate society to a national and, and people society. So this, in this transition period, gymnastics became very important, also as part of building, uh, building a nation or building democracy. Um, 
in the 80s or late 70s, we had a lot of discussion in Denmark among uh, certain scholars because some was uh, <laughs> saying that sport is based on co competition, capitalism is based on uh, competition, so capitalism and uh, sport is two sides of the same, to the, uh, to the same coin. We disagreed with that because you can see it was not only uh, in uh, capitalistic and democratic uh, states that sport uh, were the dominating uh, type of body culture. It was also in Soviet Union and it was in China and it was today it is all over the world. But that's a modern phenomena. It started in England in, uh, in the 70s and then uh, expanded to the continent and then uh, later on to the United States and today to the whole world. Um, so we were not so engaged in the connection between uh, sport and democracy, but more with sport and sportification and uh, industrialization. Yeah, there is uh, a book I just read uh, by an American scholar from Dartmouth College, uh, Paul Christensen. Uh, sport and democracy in ancient and modern world. He is, uh, according to him, there is a close connection between uh, sport, uh, horizontal sport, as he call it, horizontal sport, and implementing democracy in old Greek and in uh, modern times in, uh, in England and, and in other places in, in Europe. Um, <coughs> I have this book with me, and, um, and of, there is, uh, to some extent, it is a very good book, but there is one key problem with it, and it is, <coughs> it is because he, broke, he used this concept, sport, as a very, very broad concept. So therefore, he, 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 he doesn't have the right concepts to analyze uh, the history of body culture. Uh, so, uh, but he has, yeah, I'll just show, uh, he, he differentiates between uh, horizontal uh, and vertical sport and connect uh, horizontal uh, sport to democracy uh, in Old Greek and in, uh, in, in modern times. But um, he has a very good point uh, in the final end of his book. Because according to him, it may well be that horizontal mass sport promotes democratization until a certain threshold is reached, after which point it is either irrelevant or counterproductive. I think that's a very, uh, very wise observation that in in the beginning of the history of sport in Europe, it was uh, productive to implementing democracy and, and uh, modern, you could say modern values, but it is not sure that it will <coughs> always be in that way. It can uh, change and it can be contra, uh, productive or irre irrelevant, is his uh, point of view. And <coughs> I think we have to uh, remember that when sport was implemented in Denmark and in a number of other countries in Europe, Sport was not only implemented as an activity, sport was also implemented together with amateurism. So we have forgotten that today. Uh, but, uh, but for 100 years, it was so important that sport should be part, should be, there should be a framework around sport uh, uh, based on uh, values, amateurism. Why? Yeah, because <coughs> we, when we got democracy, we implemented, so to say, 
uh, competition as a, uh, as a, 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 an important thing because democracy is competition about power. There is different parties and they compete who is going to win the election and go into power. So competition is connected to, to democracy. But then we have um, then we have market, the capitalistic system, which are competition, free competition uh, for money, to say it short. Of course, it is very uh, <coughs> uh, short to say it in that way. But uh, we have, as we know, competition in the market system. But we also <laughs> implement competition in the public sphere in the civil society. But competition in the civil society, as they thought when they, they implemented democracy, they implemented amateurism, is that competition in the public sphere is without money. You compete to, to uh, yeah, you compete uh, <laughs> uh, to strengthen character and, and uh, norms and uh, beauty and, uh, and compete to sh uh, and show fairness and uh, fair play and sportsmanship. It was these qualities, these norms, which should be produced by sport because these norms were important uh, because you cannot only have a society built on competition for money you need to compete also about values and to implement and to strengthen certain type of values. But when amateurism was falling away, then, yeah, <coughs> then uh, you could say we, we have the present situation. Today we don't talk uh, at all about uh, amateurism. So, but we know that uh, power corrupts, therefore we have chains of power. We know that money corrupts. Uh, of course, there is not a causal connection between money and, money and corruption. Of course not. But it requires great strength of character to avoid uh, money. Uh, and uh, it is not enough to build a system on character. It is a necessary to, um, to also implement yeah, democracy, rule of law, uh, free, pre free press, critical press. And as we learned in this conference, it is now it seems to be necessary to implement whistleblowers. But that's, it tells that the system is corrupt uh, because you can't have a system dependent on whistleblowers. But as I hear some of the voices here, it is more or less uh, whistleblower we are dependent on to get uh, rid of uh, corruption and, and other uh, dirty things in uh, the system. Yes, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Uwe Kosko, for this introduction. Um, I forgot some practical info before. Um, I was told to be very, very strict on ending this session exactly at 4 o'clock because we have some buses going towards the old town of Aarhus. So everybody who wants to join the buses, please, after the session is over, hurry and get your stuff ready and join the buses. And that's for the rest of the speakers. I will also say that I'm going to stress you by stand up when there's two minutes left because we would like to have some time left for a discussion at the end of this. And therefore, also, I don't want to say too much more than presenting the next speaker, Henning Eichbach. And uh, let's see what Henning has to say about yeah. play game and so on and so forth. Welcome, Mien. Play the game, that's what we call this event. Let's uh, take a step back and look on what we are saying. Play, game, what's that? What's play, what's game? Uh, in some languages, we have these two terms. 
And evidently, they are not identical. We say animals play, but animals do not play games. If there are animal games, it's arranged by human beings. We do not talk about Olympic play. We talk about Olympic games. Why that? Uh, what's the difference and what is maybe a political point of all this? So uh, that's what I want to uh, talk about very shortly, taking the Olympics as a case and then coming to the deeper uh, wisdom of language, to the philosophy of play and having some political uh, implications. The linguistic uh, differentiations uh, ha can be found in different languages. It's not only play and game in English, where we try to communicate. Uh, it is also uh, two words in uh, Danish, in Norwegian, in Swedish, uh, in Basque. Uh, and, um, well, so we are content, we find a pattern. But there are some languages uh, which have only one word. French, le jeu, uh, German, spiel, and especially German philosophy has been the origin of much of the philosophy of play, which in this way is untranslatable because it's always about spiel and then we must think in the other languages, for example in Danish, which term should we choose and the same translation problem is the other way around. So, we have a serious problem which is not only of a translation, also of understanding. A philosophical understanding we find in this classic of Roger Caillois. That's uh, one of the few classics we have in the philosophy of play. He had a background in French language where there is only leger, leger, leger. Uh, not two, two of them. But uh, by philosophical reflection, he came to those two terms which have become uh, very important for the philosophy of play. Paidia, the unstructured play, let's say children's play. And then the rule bound formalized activities, which we call <coughs> games, ludos. Yeah, he took a uh, Latin word, the other is Greek from origin, because he had not these uh, words uh, at disposition from his French background. Well, so far, so fine, but maybe we have a problem because we like dual oppositions, don't we? Children play adults games, something like that. Yeah? Trivial as if action, play as if playing with a doll as if it's a baby, pl versus serious competition. Um, spontaneity, freedom on the one hand, rules, formal norms, on the other. Chaos versus, versus order, whatever. Uh, process versus result. That's why it could be uh, enlightening for us to turn to some other languages. In Korean, for example, I don't go in, into details now. Uh, we have not time for this. It would be very interesting. Uh, that they have three terms for uh, play. And uh, if we try to search further into a third direction, whatever it may be, so let's go to the Olympic case. Uh, the Olympic Games, um, we do not ca call them Olympic play. Um, in Danish and Swedish, where we also have two words, we have a troubling disorder because in, if you translate it from Swedish, you could, uh, say, uh, would say Olympic 
games uh, in Danish, if translated literally, it is Olympic play. Why that? So there are difficulties. Let's look at the phenomenon itself, uh, play in the connection of the Olympic Games. We find three different uh, fields where we use uh, the word. If play is present in Olympic culture, then it is the ritual. Opening ceremony, closing ceremony, uh, the framework. This can be called play. We call, uh, can call it theater play, something like that. Uh, it is show, it's festival. Uh, it is display. We have also this English term, display. Uh, strange enough, it's not from the sports tradition. Coubertin took this. He took it from the gymnastic tradition, where uh, mass arrangements uh, have been arranged through, uh, well, 100 years before. Uh, I took the pictures from 36, but we have the same uh, situation today. Mass plays, yeah? we have seen them in uh, Beijing and so on, uh, opening ceremonies, and then there is something different. And this is what we call uh, games. They, these are competitive games, uh, sport as a competitive game in the center of uh, the uh, uh, arrangement, near to work, near to production of results, centimeter, gram, seconds, points, uh, online during some parts of history with the expositions, with the world uh, expositions, which were a part of uh, Olympic uh, arrangements and the other way around. And this is what we do not call Olympic play. So these two uh, uh, we find, but there is a third. And the third is the rhetorics of Olympism. Uh, rhetorically, one refers to play as all that is good. Yeah? Uh, it's fine for children, children's play, playing together, old folk games, uh, playfulness as attitudes, all this, in the terms of self-celebration, Olympic education, and so on. Beneath this dualism of words now, we discover that there are at least three different meanings. The spontaneous play, paideia, in the terminology of Kaiwa, the rule-regulated game, Ludos, and display, theater play, fulfilling of a form, mu as we also say, music play, and so on. So there is a wisdom in language which uh, we have to recognize and uh, which uh, could be uh, the basis for uh, deeper philosophical reflections about what play is. And the point is that there is not the language, though we have chosen one language to communicate here uh, in the conference, but there are languages in plural. And languages are cultural subjects full of contradictions, which have meaning, deep meaning, showing deep culture. And the language is itself a fellow player uh, in the game of understanding. Yeah? All this, uh, we think a word must be a little box. It is not. Uh, it is uh, full of contradictions, undertones, intonations, fields of meaning, space of resonance, connotations, and so on. So we come to the philosophy of play. Play, evidently, is one, linguistically, culturally, and it is diverse, plural, many. Um, play seems to be, and this is now very, very short now, uh, practice of the poetical human being striving with a certain rhythm towards something, playful curiosity, as the Chinese 
philosopher Lin Du Tang has called it, repetition, fluctuation to and fro, that's what the philosopher Gadamer has underlined, with a certain rhythm of suspense coming out of it. And if we compare it with the question mark, we uh, may find that it could be interesting to uh, study play as a form of questioning the world. Or the other way, the question, what's that? We have very little philosophy about the question, what the question is. We use it all the time. But uh, what's the question? Uh, is it a sort of play? Making firm things flowing, whatever. If this is the case, if we think this connection, then one could have the impression that is play maybe with a focus on the question, while game is with a focus of, on the answer. And then one when we'll discover, we talk about uh, in sociology about the national question and the social question, but we never talk about the Olympic question. The Olympic results, yes, but the Olympic question, no. If not, we say questioning the Olympic system, like in this conference. Yeah? But the Olympic question is not a term we uh, normally use. Another philosophical uh, point that leads us to the final uh, political uh, point is uh, if we see all this under the aspect of what we could call the basis and the superstructure. There is a basis of uh, human and interhuman activity. It's there where we have play. It is local, it is situational. If I had a ball here and would cast um, it to you, then you would play. You could play um, without rules, just playing, as children do. That's basic. Game depends on certain rules. There are some frameworks that have to be fixed. Uh, and this is intermediary to another level, to a, a superstructure. This play seems to be also another place in between, and then we have sport. And this is organized with ideologies and so on. There we are on the level of superstructure. What does this mean for a political reflection? All this is about self-determination in play. Uh, if we play locally, evidently, and we listen to what we talk about, it is play. Locally, it's mostly play. At the moment we go to other levels, for example, regional or national, let's say Highland Games in Scotland, or Arctic Nordic Games in uh, Greenland, Canada, uh, uh, Alaska. Um, then we talk about games. And then there seems to be a mega event level that has become more and more important now, historically. Uh, and that's sport, elite sport, uh, on the global level. And here we have all these problems arising, uh, which are uh, the topic of our conference uh, with organized criminality, dictatorship, and so on. Um, so we can learn uh, something about democracy in play and game and sport, but also by play and game and sport and their difference. We can learn about democracy, that it is about ownership and about life. Well, yes, just the last point. When we play, often we laugh. Laughter is local, situational, here and now, and in between us. Systems may function, but they don't laugh. Do we laugh? Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Henning Eichbeck.
And now we are turning to Canada. Maybe Tim Walters. Um, Tim is claiming that we sometimes don't ask the right questions in sport. Tim is going to talk about football, trying to conceptualize, I believe. Trying to make us understand sport, the concept of sport in a different and new way. Welcome, Tim Walters. Thank you. You can hear okay? Yeah. Um, so this presentation is drawn from a uh, much longer work uh, that I've been working on for a couple of years and is coming out next fall, I believe, um, whose aim is to apply the theory of Slavoj Žižek, the Slovenian, Marxist, Hegelian, Lacanian philosopher, um, to world football in general, not just FIFA, although that's what I'm going to be focusing on today. Um, and to talk about how his critique of modern capitalism can be applied in ways that are counterintuitive and I think useful and practical um, to modern football, uh, which has become something strange and off-putting to many people. Um, and his work, I think, can help us propose a kind of remedy to some of the problems that have, we've been speaking a lot already about at this conference. Um, that's him, by the way. That's the best available picture of him on the internet. Um, so I am going to be focusing today just on uh, FIFA particularly, or I should say whatever organization replaces FIFA. I have zero uh, interest in defending them or suggesting that what they do can't be done by someone else. But whatever body takes charge of the governance of world football is going to require certain kinds of principles. And I'm going to make the argument that we can use some tools drawn from Zizekian theory uh, to help us develop these principles. Um, so these are the kind of founding principles that I'm going to be working on. First of all, it's the economy stupid, <coughs> to quote uh, Bill Clinton. Most importantly, I think football's problems are symptomatic of modern capitalism and its relationship to football, uh, and they should be treated as such. They are also, I think it's important to acknowledge, inevitable consequences of this relationship rather than as an uh, effect of its misapplication. Secondly, solutions must be found beyond what Zizek calls the Denkverbot, or prohibition against thinking beyond certain kinds of conservative and socially useful parameters. Um, for Zizek, capitalist systems cannot be uh, untangled um, from within these parameters. You need ideas that perhaps will seem uh, strange or reckless, um, to apply to them, and although not all of the ideas I'm going to be advancing today uh, fit that category, uh, some of them toward the end perhaps do. Next, football administration needs to be reimagined as something that's not just a business. Uh, FIFA is in fact responsible for managing a globally shared resource. It's something that we all own, uh, and it's a resource that doesn't exist on the field of play, but rather in the relationship between the field of play and the people who have passion and love for the game, such as many of us. Uh, that's ultimately the source of its incredible appeal and value. Next, the challenge of football administration is a bottom, a problem of the commons. Um, and Zizek speaks often about the fact that capitalism as a system is fundamentally ill-equipped to deal with modern problems of the commons. Uh, next, of course, football's embrace of capital has had consequences, and it continues to have consequences. Uh, capital has, capitalism has victims as a system, um, and I think that any attempt to address the problems caused by capitalism needs to begin with a solidarity with those who are these victims rather than uh, continuing to profit from them. And finally, Ultimately, the ideology of football governance, Zizek calls uh, ideology the unknown knowns, uh, needs transforming and transforming radically. Football needs to be for something else other than just for money. And I'll talk about what that might be later in the presentation. 
So how can these assumptions help us to get past the current deadlock that football finds itself in? Um, <coughs> Zizek says that, quote, in football we win if we obey the rules, in politics we win if we have the audacity to change the rules. Um, so the proposals that I suggest uh, begin fairly, I think, conventionally and reformist in character and become increasingly revolutionary to the, the ultimate question that's the kind of overarching theme for the conference of whether or not football needs reform or revolution. Uh, I think it needs both, uh, but at the minimum, revolutionary reform and needs to become for something other than what it currently is. So, solutions. First of all, term limits of four years for every elected position within FIFA, as well as for each of its national associations and the confederations. Uh, currently, FIFA is run by, like any other business, uh, largely it's run by career executives. Uh, FIFA is in charge of a resource that is not the same as that owned by any other business, and therefore I think that that's inappropriate. The counter-argument to this will be that practically FIFA has no authority over the national associations and confederations, which is certainly true. Uh, but it's also true that the associations and confederations are almost entirely dependent for their power and wealth on uh, that belonging to FIFA, primarily that derived from the World Cup. And so therefore, if FIFA made condition, as a condition of participating in its tournaments or being involved in its governance structures, compliance with these uh, suggestions, uh, then they would drop in line because they would have no choice. And that same counter-argument applies to several of the, the arguments that I'm making, not just about FIFA, but to the associations and confederations as well. Secondly, an immediate move <coughs> toward not just greater but absolute transparency of both governance and accounting decisions for the entirety of FIFA as well as for each of its associations and confederations. Each body will receive a template of accounting and reporting regulations to comply with each year, which will be independently monitored. This will include a mandated percentage of spending in certain areas as a condition of FIFA's continued distribution of funds. Third, the encouragement of broader and more participatory involvement in football governance by its stakeholders and communities, communities of interest at every level of the game. All elected positions within FIFA, its associations and confederations must be open elections in which any interested member of the footballing community can vote electronically. This technology is already available. It's inexpensive, it's easily implemented, and that's something that FIFA could take charge of for the associations and confederations as well. But everyone who has a stake in football should have a say in who runs it. Uh, this will entail an abolition of some of the recent rules that FIFA has developed regarding who is eligible to run in the first place. A few years ago, they changed the criteria so that you had to have X number of years of football governance experience at a certain level in order to be eligible. In the same way that everyone should be able to vote for who occupies these positions, everyone should be able to run for them as well. For a long time, uh, FIFA has made much of its uh, so-called apolitical status. Uh, this has always been, I think, nonsense. It isn't, nor can there be such a beast as an organization uh, of its size and scope that's apolitical. It needs to stop pretending that this is the case and proceed as an organization that has social, political, and economic principles, as all organizations do. And I think it would do well to show leadership in this regard. And there's a couple of areas that immediately leap out as those where this will be appropriate. FIFA, for instance, should become a uh, actually feminist organization and therefore mandate uh, certain levels of gender equity on all of its committees. You could, for instance, establish a rule whereby someone of, uh, you couldn't have males occupy the same position three elections in a row, for instance, that would encourage female participation. Also in terms of the distribution of its funding, um, that too could be modified in order to reflect nations that do not um, contribute to gender equity. So for instance, countries like Saudi Arabia that actively prohibit girls and women's involvement in football should have their funding from FIFA cut accordingly since they're not spending money in those areas. 
Next, a massive reduction in the obscene remuneration and benefits currently enjoyed by football executives to eliminate the grotesque inequities between the game's administrators and its real-world fans. The days of first-class air travel, on-call limousines, seven-star hotels, beautiful, bountiful free tickets for games, lavish gifts and per diems need to end and end immediately. Um, because they are managers of a shared resource, those who occupy these positions in FIFA and in the national associations should be paid uh, comparable wages to those who manage uh, other public sectors in the countries where they live. Zero tolerance for corrupt behavior and an end to the practice of providing only lifetime bans to those found robbing the spoils of the game. These punishments ought to be supplemented with football organizations pressuring law enforcement agencies to rigorously pursue legal actions against those enriching themselves and their friends through their theft of a common resource, as well as by the robust legal pursuit of stolen wealth. Number eight, the implementation of moves to bring an end to the discordant demographic homogeneity and accordingly narrow focus of those charged with managing football. FIFA and company do not just preside over the elite's game, but also the women's game, the development of the game for youth and for the differently abled, for amateur players, players' unions, supporters, groups, and so forth, and advocates for those positions should be involved at all levels of FIFA's operation. It should be reflected in their spending priorities also. Number nine, this is where they start getting a little stranger. We need to remove FIFA's ability to select World Cup hosts, which is emblematic of most of their problems. Instead, the finals should rotate through each continent in the way that they once did, but hosting rights will be given to the nation from the next continent in succession whose team does the best at the preceding World Cup. So for instance, if Asia is hosting the tournament in 2026, the Asian team that does the best in 2022 will win the right to host the tournament four years later um, rather than having it be decided by a bunch of well-paid technocrats in uh, Zurich. The only caveat to this is that in order to be eligible to exercise the right to host, nations must meet certain easily, bench easily devised benchmarks regarding human rights records, press freedoms, levels of income inequality, tolerance of racist or homophobic behavior within a country's domestic game, and so forth. World Cup finals have become prestigious tools of geopolitical soft power and excuses for socially, economically, and environmentally ruinous neoliberal deformations of the spaces in which they occur. This is as unnecessary as it is wrong. These tournaments should be celebrations of football and the places in which it is loved. I think this will accomplish several things at the same time. It will empower footballers, which is proper, and create tournaments that are more exciting for more people. National teams that may not have a chance to win the competition can still compete to win something meaningful, the right to host in their country four years later. It will de-incentivize all kinds of irresponsible spending currently associated by mega events uh, as part of their hosting responsibilities because they will have less time and no need to make hasty promises about what they will be doing. And simultaneously, it will incentivize responsible spending. The only ways in which a nation can increase the chances of their hosting a tournament will be long and short-term investment in their football development programs and infrastructure and ensuring they comply with the ethical benchmarks required of host nations. Um, so it will provide them with reasons uh, to spend their public coffers wisely. It will also be much cheaper, both for FIFA and the host nations. FIFA spent 4.8 billion U.S. dollars, uh, sorry, made 4.8 billion U.S. dollars on last World Cup, but spent 2.3 billion dollars. And there's a bunch of other advantages I can speak about perhaps afterwards as well. Finally, since I see you standing there. Um, I, ultimately, I think the, the question that uh, for Zizek is central about uh, the, the problem of football governance at the minute is the question of what football and FIFA is for today, um, aside from the obvious. Uh, what are those institutions uh, committed to or responsible for? So I make the argument that we need to take FIFA literally um, and commit and force it to commit to its primary organi organizational claim uh, FIFA's claim on its website is that it's for the game and for the world. 
So I suggest that 50% of all of FIFA's income should be dispersed annually to the United Nations World Food Program into perpetuity with the rest, all of the expenses that they currently deal with aside, um, going to the national associations and federations. This should begin with an immediate payment of one half of its current approximate $1.5 billion cash reserves um, to that organization immediately. Putting the money in this hands would save the lives of around 5 million men, women, and children who are currently living in extreme poverty by providing them with enough, with enough food for a year that's about the size of the population of Denmark. This would be a historic accomplishment, the greatest thing that has ever happened as a result of 22 humans kicking a ball around. This should not be misread as an act of charity or corporate reputation scrubbing. It is rather a long overdue first repayment that is owed to those from whom it has been taken through the disastrous entangling of a beautiful game with capital and its interests. Having said that, it will be politically uh, popular, it will be popular with fans, it will be popular with sponsors, and it will probably do more to change FIFA's reputation uh, and make it for something positive um, almost immediately. In closing, our view of what football's power can accomplish has become so shrunken that much of this may seem fanciful or utopian. It isn't. FIFA's very existen existence currently hangs in the balance. It needs a radical reimagining but lacks a vision of what that might be, and therefore a window of opportunity has appeared within which we can and must be audacious enough to change the rules and offer an alternative answer to the question of what FIFA and football is for. Today, we have the chance to fundamentally revolutionize the ways in which world football <coughs> is governed, to reshape the ideological framework within, foot, within which football is defined and understood, and to work toward a game that is for the people. All of this can be done, and it can be done in the words of the peerless footballing philosopher Socrates, while simultaneously, quote, struggling for freedom, for respect for human beings, for equality, for ample and unrestricted discussions, for a professional democratization of unforeseen limits, and all of this while preserving the ludic and the joyous and the pleasurable nature of this activity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tim Walters, for some strong suggestions for a new FIFA. And we are heading back overseas to Sweden. Johan Ekberg, yeah, he's going to tear apart the Olympism, the idea of Olympism and hopefully try and put it all back together in a new perspective for us. All right, can everybody hear me? Yep, perfect. Uh, my name is Johan Ekberg uh, out of uh, Malmö University, Sweden. Uh, and my topic here is yeah, well, moving from CSEC and FIFA to uh, French philosopher Derrida and uh, the Olympic movement and the Olympic philosophy. Deconstructing Olympism, applying the mindset of Jacques Derrida on the notion of Olympism. And this topic is a bit different here from the ones discussed uh, so far. Uh, but the overarching theme of this session is rethinking philosophy. And this definitely uh, fits that model. Okay, so a few initial notes here to start with. Uh, yeah, this is a rather abstract and very specific philosophical take on the uh, Olympic philosophy. And it needs to be pointed out here that I do not claim this approach uh, taken here that to be a more accurate or more true description of the reality uh, that I'm trying to criticize or trying to deconstruct. I'm offering a specific take, and it's up to you to decide whether, whether or not it's worthy of consideration. And there are many possible objections to this, and I expect to hear some very good ones uh, once I'm done talking here. Uh, what I argue here is that uh, yeah, there are several intellectual properties of the Olympic movement which are protected by law, such as the Olympic rings, the Olympic anthems, uh, the Olymp anthem, and so on. And I argue that this, there's a, a rarely talked about aspect of the Olympic intellectual property, uh, the production of Olympic knowledge. Uh, mostly that to a certain extent is owned by the Olympic movement themselves. Uh, and mostly this will circle around Olympism in academic research, but what I will talk about does also have implications on the <laughs> real world as such, uh, in, in the sense that how 
we understand the Olympic movement and Olympic philosophy, how we uh, see it, how, um, yeah, how we see what it is. And what I will not do, I will not to try to define Olympism, uh, firstly because it would take the entire day, uh, but more importantly because doing so would go against the stand I'm initiating here, uh, and we will get, get back to that. And you probably all have some sense of what the Olympic philosophy is, the Olympic spirit, the Olympic values, uh, the Olympic ideals. Here are some catchy slogans that you'll find on the Olympic website. Uh, a philosophy of life or building a better world through sports. And it's all, uh, they list the fundamental principles uh, in the charters. You can read them if you're interested. But I'm not trying to define them. Uh, and furthermore, I will not uh, give example of my data or the outcome here. Uh, I won't get into actual empir empirical data. Uh, so this is like a research pitch. Uh, that's, that's how you should look at it. That I'm arguing for why this approach is needed. Because uh, in order for the outcome to make sense, you first need the explanation. Uh, so that's to make this as tangible as possible. Uh, I will focus on that. Uh, but I will gladly give some examples of it afterwards. Oh yeah. So, uh, outline here shortly. I will bring some key aspects, uh, bring up some key aspects for adopting this stand in the first place. That will feed into the actual research problem that I've identified, and I'll show you how Jacques Derrida can help. And then I'll talk about what the construction is. And then add some final remarks. All right. Uh, so, of course, in my, in my writing, I build up this uh, with a bunch of references to prove my points here, but I've skipped a few, few steps, and I'll simply land here in the key premises for adopting this stand. And the first one is the presence of Olympism in Olympic research. That Often when academics engage with the Olympic studies, with the Olympic movement, Olympism is very apparent, and there seems to be a constant need to relate to it. Uh, and to this guy, and you might recall this morning, uh, when we the representative from IOC talked about ethics. He showed a picture of Pierre de Coubertin, the founder of the movement. Uh, so there's all, always this historical attachment that we need to relate to uh, and a, a sense of how it should be, like an ideal somewhere. And so that's point one. Um, also, there's competing views and a lack of coherence of what Olympism actually is. And as pointed out by Da Costa, Brazilian professor of sport history, there seems to be like a circular reasoning to it. So uh, even if, we, if a negative side of the Olympic is noted, it's always contrasted with this positive value that's supposed to be, be there. And that's a circular reasoning that you never can get out of, he argues. Uh, so if you put these two aspects together and then add that the mission of the IOC is to promote Olympism throughout the world and to lead the Olympic movement, of course, uh, that gives us, that gives me the following research problem, that Olympic research seems to be strongly influenced by a no contested notion, which is driven and promoted by the organization behind what that very research supposedly is to reach objective conclusions regarding. So, how do we understand this? And this is how the guy to the left can help, Shaq Derrida. And the key words here are history and the authority of meaning. So Jacques Derrida and his mindset. So what do we got here? His major contribution has been his insistence that history is a metaphysical concept according to which the meaning of history always amounts to the history of meaning. Does that make any sense? Uh, according to Derrida, writing is what determines history. All right? Uh, and what uh, Derrida does is an attempt to systema systematize a deconstructive critique against the authority of meaning, who decides what it means. Okay, so bring some clarity to this. So a Derridian read on the history of Olympism means that its meaning, what Olympism means, is dependent on the meaning that has been applied to it throughout history. So writing or Olympic research is what determines what it is, according to Derrida. So who has the authority of meaning. Is it the individual researchers that, yeah, to a certain extent, maybe? But the argument here is that there is a higher authority which influences what these researchers do. 
Yeah, uh, but isn't Olympism being criticized? Isn't there a criticism towards the Olympic movement? Of course there is. I mean, this whole conference is criti cri criticizing all kinds of stuff, including the Olympic movement. Uh, and this is taken somewhat out of context, but it pinpoints uh, the problem from a Derridian point of view here. It's a quote by uh, Mangan that wherever there is criticism of the Olympic movement, it's intended to be constructive to assist the movement in the decade ahead and to help it move closer to the realization of its ideal. Okay, so we're critical towards something because it needs to be get back to something, an ideal, a core of what it is. And from what Derrida says, he questions the very idea that there is an ideal, that there is a stable center there. So being critical is not enough, Derrida suggests. So what does he offer instead? Well, he talks about deconstruction. So what is it? It means that you're putting pressure on the presence the usage and the ascribed meaning of Olympism. When Olympism is used, uh, you put pressure on it to uh, sort of collapse, it will collapse under the, uh, under the pressure. The binary law of presence is what he talks about. So you put pressure on that it's supposed to be something good, and then you show that it can easily be something bad. So yeah, deconstruction seeks to undo both a given order of priorities and the very system of conceptual opposition that makes that order possible. Uh, yeah, we, which makes that very hierarchical order possible. It's a, it's a matter of upsetting the balance which creates the problem here. It's the power of the written world, the writing history, uh, and the constant attempts of redefining Olympism and the order of opposition towards Olympism. And that's what enables Olympism to be present in Olympic research and thus create what we know about the Olympic movement. So that's the knowledge production right there. And the authority of meaning, who decides what it means? Well, this is an example of one of the structures I'm looking at here. This is the Olympic Studies Center. If you go into the Olympic website, olympic.org, you'll find this under Olympism. Uh, what it does is that it gathers sources and references of what Olympism is, the official, official sources and, and references. And they give grants to certain research projects, which then ends up as, as a reference to Olympism. Uh, so what I'm doing right now is that I'm deconstructing these uh, references that have received money to create some certain kind of research that then ends up as a reference of what the Olympic philosophy is. And this is hierarchically underneath the IOC, obviously. Uh, so you can see the knowledge production right there. And another, another structure that I briefly mentioned, I was uh, nominated to go to the International Olympic Academy in Greece uh, as the Swedish nominee from the Swedish Olympic Committee, uh, where they gathered people, 35 participants from all over the world uh, for a month uh, of studying the Olympic philosophy. Uh, and the main thing for us, what they urged us to do was to go back home, <coughs> spread Olympism to everyone, convince your ministries that impose Olympism. The more Olympism, the better. Uh, that's also a structure of the knowledge production. Uh, I'll give one brief example of, uh, I think we've got time for that, yeah? One brief example uh, of a deconstructed outcome here. Okay, we go back to that. This is a, uh, an, uh, one of the references noted here. It's uh, Olympism and the nation building from a cultural perspective. And it's uh, one of the uh, projects received grants from the Olympic Studies Center. And it's about uh, a specific neighborhood in China that was uh, totally uh, remade during the uh, Beijing Olympics, a cultural heritage. Uh, and he's, uh, he's writing about this, and he's obviously very critical about what, what happened with this old uh, Mongol heritage area. Uh, it was made into a showcase street for tourists. And obviously the Olympic movement to a certain degree made this happen. So he's very critical about this. And he's stating that it's not coherent with the Cobertans' history-anchored ideals of common identity for humanity. 
so this is very critical uh, of uh, what the Olympic movement brought to, uh, to China in this case in this specific uh, neighborhood. But his, uh, he's saying that this is not in line with Olympism. Because uh, Olympism for him was something else, an ideal, and anchored with what de Coubertin once meant Olympism to be. Uh, so he's critical towards the Olympic movement, but Olympism still remains positive because uh, he's using the old writing, the previous research that has reintroduced re Olympism as something good. Uh, so what the deconstruction here can do is to show that it might easily be the other way around, that it was actually Olympism that caused this. Like uh, Olympism in action, building a better world through sport. So it's, if you twist it and you say that, yeah, this is Olympism that led to uh, this whole Mongol heritage uh, being totally remade. Uh, but instead, his research shows that Olympism remained something positive and this was something else that happened. And this reproduces Olympism as something good and that's exactly what the Olympic movement would like to see. Okay, going back there, sorry about this. So the final remarks here, what should we bring with us for this very confusing presentation, I guess. Uh, so the production of Olympic knowledge, we should be aware of it and consider it perhaps in its current state as a part of the Olympic intellectual property that is some, somehow owned by the Olympic movement itself. So what I argue here is that Olympic research needs to break free from its chains, that it needs to dislocate itself. Olympic studies needs to dislocate itself from Olympism because there, you could argue there's a bias there. Uh, so you need to Im avoid the embedded normativity of how it should be, how the Colbertin once wanted it to be. Uh, and that's what deconstruction can do. Uh, and if not, we'll continue to reconstruct Olympic knowledge in the, in the way we're doing, and the knowledge production will persist, and Olympism will re still remain something good no matter what the Olympic movement does. So that was I had to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Johan Ekbar. And uh, considering what we heard from Henning Eichberg earlier, it would be interesting to think about uh, Olympism in a plural perspective and not a singularis. Um, the last presentation here today is uh, from, from the United States. Scott Jetlika. I don't know if I pronounce that right. <laughs> I hear that it's okay. And now we're going to hear about a regime, the international sport as one regime. I'm very interested to hear what that means. All right, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Oh, oh okay. Forgive me. Um, so like the other speakers here, I, uh, am uh, hoping to uh, talk about or hope to expand or change in some way um, how we think about and how we understand uh, international sport in particular. And uh, this is part of a much larger project um, dealing with uh, theorizing international sports political status. But it's built upon this idea of characterizing or defining sport in terms of an international regime. So. Um,
in any case, I'll uh, continue to talk while we fix this. Um, my presentation today is built around three key questions or ideas. First is defining this concept of an international regime, what it means within an academic setting, within the study of international relations. Um, making the case for defining sport in these terms. Um, so looking at whether the definitional elements are present, um, you know, is there an enforcement framework, are there organizations, are there mechanisms for actually placing boundaries around this, uh, this area of international politics, um, is sport politically significant, I won't spend much time on that uh, since the answer is somewhat self-evident. Um, and then finally talk about what the implications might be for international sport governance. Um, so first to deal with this concept of uh, an international regime. Uh, perhaps for some of you this has a negative connotation. When we hear the word regime, we often uh, have the uh, word preceding it being authoritarian or oppressive or things like this. Um, from an academic standpoint, uh, much more value neutral in terms of its definition. And this is just one definition of a regime, uh, but it's an often used one. Uh, regimes are principles, norms, rules, and decision-making procedures around which actors' expectations converge in a given area of international politics. Um, so basically what we're talking about here is a distinct area uh, in which we have some measure of predictability. Uh, there are standards and ways of doing things. And so to define each of these definitional, definitional components very briefly, principles are sort of fundamental beliefs about how the world is and how it ought to work. Um, norms are, as in any social world, uh, standards for acceptable behavior, ways of doing things, rights and obligations. Uh, rules are rules, um, and uh, decision-making procedures are sort of the, again, generally accepted ways of uh, enacting policies, of uh, developing policies. Um, for our purposes here today, the two uh, elements that I want to focus on are principles and norms. And uh, Oh, this very briefly, some examples of other sorts of regimes. But um, focusing on principles and norms uh, primarily because um, rules and decision-making procedures are variable within a regime over time. Um, so over a period of years, over a period of decades, we might see changes in how the regime operates in terms of rules and decision-making procedures. Um, but principles and norms are really sort of the essential components of an international regime. Um, and so I want to focus on these today because um, when I conclude, I'll suggest that these are the things that we need to focus on if we're focusing on trying to change or improve international sport governance. Um, so what I want to do next is sort of see whether these elements, we can observe these things within international sport. And obviously I'm going to argue that we can. Uh, when it comes to principles, um, you know, things like uh, sport as a tool for social development. Uh, we see this in, uh, as uh, Johan just mentioned, the uh, philosophy of Olympism. Uh, we see this in sport accord statutes, um, this idea that sport should be placed in the service of humanity. Um, I should note that uh, these are espoused principles. They may not necessarily be the ones that are actually uh, acted upon, but uh, again, trying to just illustrate that there are these uh, definitional elements of a regime present within international sport. Um, again, the, U, uh, the UNESCO charter that will be discussed on the last day of this conference also speaks to this idea of sport in the service of humanity. Um, political autonomy, a subject that has been often discussed uh, already at this conference, um, the uh, sort of uh, idea that to operate effectively to perhaps achieve uh, these sorts of uh, high-minded goals that sport needs to be autonomous. And finally, uh, you know, the idea of non-discrimination, again, common across many sport organizations. Um, obviously a positive to some extent in terms of uh, discriminating on the basis of ethnicity or gender or so forth. Um, but also can, uh, as some other presenters noted, make for some strange be bedfellows when it comes to hosting international sporting events. Um, in terms of norms then as well, uh, I think that we can identify some uh, generally accepted 
uh, ways of organizing uh, that are evident across many different international sport organizations, um, you know, and within the system itself. Uh, the idea of one international uh, organization, one governing body per sport, uh, one national governing body per nation per sport, um, uh, the uh, similar organizational structures we see across uh, various sports and various contexts in terms of uh, how these uh, different organizations are uh, structured. Uh, competition cycles, again, something we take for granted as a uh, well-entrenched norms in terms of how often we have our championships and how often uh, we uh, hold these uh, events, whether they're individual sport championships or um, multi-sport championships. Um, attitudes towards doping, um, as we heard last night, uh, very much uh, working within the uh, test and punish framework to some extent. Um, and uh, methods for adjudicating legal disputes. Um, again, the arbitration method is sort of the uh, generally accepted norm uh, within international sport. Uh, finally, and just very briefly, uh, you know, now that we can maybe make the case that there are these principles and norms within international sport, um, the next step is to uh, you know, understand or make the case that uh, there is an enforcement framework that uh, polices these boundaries and makes sure that people are complying with these principles and norms. And um, obviously this is the case. We wouldn't be here discussing sport governance otherwise. Um, this is the IOC, the international federations, the associations of Olympic committees, uh, Sport Accord and other associations of IFs, uh, the World Anti-Doping Agency and its constituent organizations, um, CAS, uh, you know, all of these organizations work uh, in concert most of the time to uh, reinforce, to establish these boundaries for international sport. Um, and finally, the last point I had on my uh, introductory slide, um, is sport politically relevant? Is this something that can be understood in terms of international politics? And again, uh, uh, preaching to the converted here perhaps, uh, that yes, sport is politically relevant. Um, the claims to its neutrality, to its political transcendence um, uh, are somewhat off the mark. So what does this all mean for practical implications, for uh, how we move forward in understanding international sport in, in terms of international politics? I have three, uh, three suggestions, two practical, one perhaps a little more uh, revolutionary in nature. Um, the, uh, the first is that um, when, uh, if, if state involvement in sport governance, something that was discussed this morning, um, is uh, desired, if we want to understand the relationship between states and sport, um, understanding international sport as a regime um, helps to explain the reluctance or the reticence of states to be involved at the international level in sport governance, the reasons why they respect uh, this claim to autonomy. And it's because they have to some measure internalized over time the, uh, the ideas, the definitional elements about what international sport is supposed to be like. And if they understand or there's this broad consensus that international sport ought to be autonomous, that this is the way international sport works, um, then it's not surprising that they would be uh, uh, reluctant or hesitant or conflicted about um, uh, challenging uh, that belief. Um, if state intervention is desired, um, again, from a practical standpoint, we may need to uh, think about or consider the, the possibility that uh, attracting such intervention, attracting such oversight or cooperation uh, may need to be framed not in sport terms, but in state interest terms. So, um, you know, this was uh, to some extent the case with the development of uh, WADA. Uh, governmental involvement uh, really reached a critical mass uh, when that issue was defined not strictly in terms of elite sport, but as a public health issue. Uh, to the same extent, the FBI crackdown on FIFA within the United States was not done solely in the service of uh, bettering international soccer, but because uh, they were losing out on tax revenues. Uh, so if state involvement is, is um, desired, is required, or seen as necessary, 
um, from a practical standpoint, we may need to uh, rethink how we're framing these governance issues. Uh, finally, as I said, uh, more uh, perhaps uh, radically, uh, this conference is about change. Uh, as, uh, as Tim noted, the, uh, the subheading is reform or revolution. Um, and uh, is, is Bruce Kidd still here? Uh, I think he asked the question this morning of, uh, you know, most of these suggestions, you know, that we've heard so far tend more towards the reform uh, side of that, uh, of that uh, question. But if we understand international sport governance in this way, and we understand uh, it as an international regime, uh, change may need to occur not at the rules and decision-making procedures level, but at the principles and norms level, uh, which uh, at least in my view uh, would be more towards the revolutionary side of things. Uh, so thank you for bearing with me through the technical difficulties, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Scott. <laughs> That was very brief, and now I would like to invite the, all the speakers up for the panel. I think I will uh, follow the trend of uh, Pilker and ask you for three questions, ending with a question mark, and then we can maybe also if it addressed for a special or certain person up here, and then we will take the answers afterwards. So any questions? Hello, I'm on. Great. I'm Casper. I'm from the NOC of Denmark. This is for maybe Henning Eichberg and maybe for Tim as well. Uh, I was wondering why you didn't mention the, the concept or the vision of, uh, about non-profit in your, in your presentation. Be because, you know, the, the, the concept of non-profit is actually a very good concept, we could maybe agree, that the goal itself is not to earn money, to, but to spend money to the activity. And Henning, I'm sure that you have some ideas about if we could reinvent this concept, because we know a lot about it in Denmark. We have these uh, local associations of sport, where we have a long tradition about not earning money, but making money to the activity. Could it be maybe one way the solution to reinvent also the Olympic way or the Olympic play. Thank you. Thank you, Casper. And in the back. Hi, uh, Laura Robinson from Canada. And uh, this is a question for Tim, but other people could address it if they choose. Because you, you looked at, uh, you know, a critique of capitalism with FIFA, but I'm, but and you did mention in one of your points about equality for women, but. I'm wondering how, uh, if you could, could you also reframe it in um, a critique of patriarchal capitalism? Because it seems to me that soccer is worth a lot more if men kick the ball than it is when women kick the ball. And the players are worth a lot more. As we know, you know, the women at the World Cup this year tried uh, at the Ontario Human Rights Commission to uh, get the... Um, get the field changed to a natural uh, grass and, and they had to quit their challenge because, because FIFA was uh, so um, critical of the women players who were challenging. So I'm wondering if you could also speak to uh, a patriarchal capitalism. Thank you very much. And the last question over here. Um, my name is Katrina and I'm a Danish journalism student. And um, I was just wondering about um, actually, in the same neighborhood as, as that question, where it talked about uh, Tim Walters should talk about women's rights and that uh, FIFA should play a role in promoting certain values. And um, I, um, I was talking to another researcher about sports, and he he was um, like arguing how FIFA shouldn't be this um, shouldn't take like monopoly on values and like impose Western values on other, all the other countries. So might it be a danger? Uh, if FIFA starts to um, to, s to um, advocate for certain values instead of just 
bringing a lot of different countries with different value sets together where we agree on soccer and that's what we agree on. Maybe not on other things, but we can play soccer. I don't know if you can follow that. Okay, three qualified questions. Who will start with Henning Eifer on the non-profit issue? Yeah. Um. Okay, yeah. Um, the non-profit uh, question is a part of uh, the, the larger societal uh, connection, uh, which is especially interesting in its change uh, if you look on Olympism, yeah? which uh, started as a non-profit lodge of mostly aristocratic people, which were taken by Pierre de Coubertin, to boast a sort, certain religious idea. Yeah? Um, then it changed on the way. And uh, the first problematical change was not money and profit and market. It was state. Yeah? With a top uh, in the Nazi Olympics uh, 36, which... Uh, Coubertin was ver very enthusi enthusiastic uh, about. Um, now it became a sort of state arrangement under fascism. So from civil society, non-profit lodge, to public event, uh, state uh, events. And then, uh, especially since the uh, 1980s, uh, we see this transformation to um, market uh, dimension of Olympic sports. So we have three different elements, civil society, state, uh, market, uh, which all are related to uh, this um, uh, Olympic sport. If we take other sports, um, then maybe we... Uh, become aware that it's not just harmless here to say, well, now we make it non-profit. Let's take TAFISA, uh, the International Sport for All organization, which uh, has got, um, if you look on the level, Olympic dimensions, global dimensions. Um, and it's princ in, in principle, it's about non-profit sport. And yet, uh, many of the problems that we touch here about the distance between what people do, what they play here, and who controls and who does, uh, who organizes and manages the game, also appear in this world. That is why uh, it is a very important question about non-profit and the market dimension, and yet there seem to be other dimensions too that are relevant. Thank you. And uh, team, if you have a short comment on that, and maybe you can also merge it into the next question of the gender perspective. <laughs> sure. It's working now. Um, <coughs> so uh, Zizek identifies himself as a communist um, of a kind of new kind, along with a bunch of other contemporary philosophers like uh, Alain Badiou and... Um, uh, Antonio Negri and Frederick Jameson. So I'm very much attracted uh, in the, the longer work that I'm working on to the idea of not-for-profit sports. Um, but specifically as regards FIFA, uh, there has probably never been an organization in human history that seems less capable of becoming not-for-profit. Um, so the, the two general directions by way as kind of big ideas for transforming that organization that I've been working on, um, one is a series of alternatives that, that has football move backwards toward a point when less money was involved in the game. Um, and certainly that was originally the case as football evolved, but even until quite recently, um, the notion that uh, a country like Qatar would spend a hundred and Twenty billion dollars um, building things in order to have a, a month-long football tournament would have seemed like madness. I mean, it still seems like madness, but 
Um, so the idea that, that that organization in particular could in any way be kind of uh, moved back toward that, I think, is, is probably unrealistic at this point, unfortunately. Um, but it's also the case that because of its hyper-capitalization, um, that opens up different potentials. Uh, and one of those potentials is that that money could be uh, diverted or returned um, to the people who've been victimized by capital. So until uh, the happy day comes when uh, the idea of not-for-profit international football is an option, um, that's what I'll be recommending. Um, and to the other questions, uh, Laura, um, I guess when I'm talking about capitalism, uh, the, the word that comes before it that I don't include is patriarchal capitalism, and that's, again, embodied as uh, fully and obscenely as can be imagined uh, when you're talking about FIFA and the, the tournament in Canada this past summer um, is a kind of exceptional example of that. We're talking about an organization that has $1.5 billion sitting in the bank um, but couldn't afford the, the five or six million dollars it would have taken to lay uh, turf fields so that the best women players on the planet um, could literally play on an even playing field uh, rather than on these terrible 3G pitches that radiated heat. So if you followed the tournament the second half of the games, you could see the women were becoming kind of increasingly exhausted. Um, and the final question, sorry, I, I, I didn't catch your name. Katrina. Um, there's always a, for an international organization, uh, especially one that has often been criticized for being, uh, and in, in many ways rightly criticized for being Eurocentric, um, there's always a danger of marginalizing uh, the values and the ways of being um, that are shared by the other, you know, 100 and however many uh, federations around the world that play this game as well. The, the counter-argument that I would make, I suppose, or the defense that I would make is that FIFA already has values. Um, so it talks all the time about being apolitical, but only when it's convenient to do so. So it doesn't see um, allowing certain corporations to become sponsors of the game as being a political decision or an endorsement of that corporation. It doesn't see giving the tournament to a country that's willing to allow, I think, so far a 1,000 migrant workers to die building stadiums uh, as being a political decision. Uh, of course they are. Um, so any organization that opera operates at that level um, and, and within those spheres of influence uh, always will have political positions, whether they choose to identify them as such or not. Um, I would make the argument, and this is, I guess, perhaps unfashionable or uh, objectionable to the moral relativists in the room that some political positions are better than others. Um, and the, the political position that women and girls should not be allowed to play football uh, is odious um, and should not be rewarded. Thank you. Do we have any more questions, possibly for any of the other uh, representatives in the panel? No? No questions? Yes? Hello. Hello. My name is Murat. I'm studying philosophy in Copenhagen University, and I have a bachelor degree from Aarhus University in sports science. So uh, the, the everyday difficulty for me is to communicate with philosophers about sport and, with, and sport, uh, philosophy with uh, sports scientists. Um, and it's a, it's a new phenomenon, I think. But I've been studying Derrida a little and uh, the way I understood Derrida it is you have to be contextual about thinking you have to understand the the, um, the deconstruction and this question is to Johan Ekberg, um, the deconstruction um, from the phenomenon itself he tries in this letter to a Japanese friend to uh, explain what the construction means. And he starts with the uh, verb destruction, uh, which comes from Heidegger, and he has already difficulties to uh, explain what deconstruction, uh, destruction is uh, in French. 
uh, how are the similarities between destruction and deconstruction. So somehow I understand this letter to a Japanese friend as sarcasm or as a joke because it's very difficult to explain to a Japanese guy in Japan what deconstruction is. Um, so, so, the th so the question, question is, I'm sorry, uh, but there is a basis in this. Um, the question is also to Eichberg that when we are trying to uh, com um, compare uh, Asian culture with Western culture and all these comparisons, we somehow get away from the problem itself, which Derrida, I think, is supposed to say that deconstruction is to be uh, by the phenomenon itself because <coughs> it deconstructs itself. And so when you try to say that we have to deconstruct Olymp Olympism from a literal way, I think um, that we are moving away from the problem itself. So when we academics try to explain phenomenons, we are already made a big mistake because we are away from the problem itself. So when we try to explain, uh, deconstruct, um, play or game, the wor these words, and from a deconstruction. Excuse me, I'm yeah. sorry, but it, it's very interesting. So but yeah, <laughs> but this was a question to Johan Eckberg. Okay. I hope I try could explain myself. So do we have a problem here in deconstructing? Thank you. Uh, I'm not too sure how to, uh, how to counter that, but yeah. Uh, of course, deconstruction is very, very contextual. Uh, and you, you, you can't get away from that. Uh, and and yeah, and, and you could refuse uh, my uh, suggestion or, or my approach by saying that I'm uh, even already by initiating what I'm trying to say, I'm doing exactly uh, the opposite of what I'm trying to achieve. Uh, and that's uh, and that's always uh, always an issue you, you can't really uh, escape in, in one way. Uh, so the uh, uh, I mean the, the, the I guess the uh, the end response or the uh, the counter argument would still be that is it worth saying what I'm saying? Uh, does it leave any marks uh, or is it? I mean, it does the uh, if you want to accept the approach or not, it's up to uh, anyone listening to it. Uh, and if if somebody finds it that it gives something to the discussion, then it's worth saying it. But you, but yeah, as you can't, you can never escape the uh, the uh, circular reasoning into that sense. So yeah, uh, that's about the what I <laughs> what I can say. Thank but you, thank you very much. And I will uh, let Henning Eifer also uh, answer to it and. But before, I would like to ask a question to uh, Uwe Korsko, who's talking about sport is only one part of body culture. And maybe you can elaborate on about if you think that sport in the future has a future, modern sport even, or do we see the body culture moving towards something else in 1,500 years, maybe? It's a big task to ask you. But Henning first, and then Uwe. Henny, I think maybe I don't know if you have a qu uh, any uh, responses to the the question about deconstruction. No, no. Um, then we'll move on to uh, over. Yeah, uh, uh, my my background is not uh, Derrida, and I don't use uh, the word deconstruction. I uh, I like it, <laughs> but I, I don't use it, and I difficult to to relate my my things. It's so very yeah. fair. We will yeah. let you Sorry. elaborate on that on a different yeah. occasion. Yeah. Over Kosko. Yeah. Uh. <coughs> yeah, of course. <coughs> um, when we, <coughs> we differentiate between a sport and body culture and look at sport as a specific type of body culture, very much connected to yeah, uh, industrialization and, and sportification, this connection. Then th the question raised, what, what will happen in the future? Uh, and, and again, to be very rough, um, we can use the concept uh, post-industrial society. 
if we use that, then the question raised, what kind of body culture will develop, are under development in, the, in a post-industrial uh, society? And in my book back from 1982, uh, A Fight About the Body, uh, there I <coughs> imagine that um, <coughs> we, we see some new tendencies uh, which are not sport in the narrow sense of uh, using the concept sport. Uh, I, I'm talking about uh, three new waves, uh, a green wave. Uh, it is not a new wave. We have seen a green wave, and Henning uh, has uh, pointed to that uh, in his uh, historical studies. Rousseau was a green wave, and we had uh, another green wave uh, also in the, which also affected body culture in the beginning of the, of the uh, 20th century. But the last 30 years, we have also seen a green wave uh, affecting body culture. Um, today, it is so normal, so people think, a lot of people think that uh, it has always been in that way, but it is a new phenomenon that that uh, we are running out into nature. Before, it was on the stadi stadi stadium. And, and uh, so, yeah, that can be said, I cannot go in, in detail, of course, but I use the concept a green wave and a yellow wave. The yellow wave is uh, what has to do with, yeah, yoga and relaxation and a lot of activities uh, inspired by Eastern uh, and also California uh, uh, tendencies. Uh, and I also use the concept a brown, a brown wave. Uh, uh, and, um, and you can also see that in, in body culture with gymnastic, dance, and, and, uh, and uh, and other type of, uh, of uh, body culture. So I think at the same time we have sport has, is so, so dominating as never before. But at the same time we can see new uh, tendencies. We don't know what will happen in the future, but we can see um, type of body culture which are not based on the concept um, uh, Cetius, altius, fortius, uh, faster, uh, higher, and stronger. They are built. They have. They are built on other norms and other uh, values and other ideals than uh, than sport. So I think it is much much more complex than using the the concept sport on all what we are looking at as uh, body culture. Thank okay. you. And um, I'm sorry, Henning, but we have to <laughs> end this uh, very interesting afternoon. The buses are leaving very soon. So thank you all for attending. And let's keep thinking about this. Okay.